Hi, my name is Miguel Branco. I'm working in Coimbra, Portugal, in prenatal diagnosis. And I would like to thank the Canon team for invitation to give this talk on neurosonography guidelines to clinical cases. ISOG recently updated his guideline on fetal brain evaluation. The first part is dedicated to the screening and relies on axial evaluation, transventricular transcerebral planes. The transthalamic plane is reserved for biometry purpose. We should be familiar with different aspects of the fetal brain throughout the gestation. In most countries, the screening relies on mid-trimester scan, but these guidelines also give us information about the first trimester and early second trimester scans. I will start with the transventricular plan. Here we should look at head shape and integrity. We should locate the cranial sutures, coronal and lambdoid, and use them as acoustic windows. In the transventricular plane, we should evaluate the anterior complex and the distal atrium. The anterior complex is one of the key anatomic landmarks of the brain that interrupts the anterior source of interhemispheric fissure and is constituted by carbon cetoplucidum, leaflets of the septum, anterior horns of the lateral ventricles, genu of the corpus callosum, and interhemispheric fissure. Non visualization of CSP can be a clue of pathology of midline structures. In this situation, we have an absent CSP with dilated interhemispheric fissure, which associated with a teardrop ventricle is very suggestive of a genesis of corpus callosum. That must be confirmed in mid-sagittal and coronal views. Absence of CSP with fused anterior horns is very suggestive of a genesis of CSP but we must prompt the differential diagnosis with lobar oloprosencephaly and septoatic dysplasia. In a genesis of CSP, we have fused anterior horns and a otherwise normal brain morphology with a normal corpus callosum. By contrast, in lobar oloprosencephaly, we have fused frontal horns and a digenetics or absent corpus callosum with the anterior cerebral artery running under the skull. Sometimes we are not able to identify the CSP because the CSP don't have any fluid on it. It's a dry CSP. In this situation, we are able to identify the two leaflets of CSP without any fluid on it. In coronal view, we can see the two leaflets and in top right, normal control with the fluid in it. On sagittal view, we can view a normal corpus callosum and no fluid on the CSP. If isolated, this is probably benign. An abnormal squarish shape of the CSP is a clue of partial agenesis of corpus callosum. In this situation, we have a shorter and wider CSP squarish, and in sagittal view, we could diagnose an hypoplastic corpus callosum. In a routine screening, we should also evaluate and measure the distal atria. Ventricomegaly, which is a measure over 10 mm, is a marker of abnormal cerebral development. In order to avoid the overestimation and the false positives, we should have a standardized ventricular measurement.
with a strict axial plane with the anatomic reference on the image, the ambient system and the CS and we should locate the distal atria, identify the periato-occipital sulcus and place the caliper at this level. The caliper should be placed inner to inner fashion and we should have a measure inferior to 10 millimeters. The second axial plane is the transcerebellar one. For this, we must tilt the probe posteriorly and access the posterior fossa through the mastoid fontanelle. On axial evaluation of the posterior fossa, we should identify the cerebellum, the cisterna magna. In the cisterna magna, we can find always sin septation, which are normal findings. To identify the vermis, we should locate the forward ventricle, and the vermis is the hyperechoic structure posterior to it. The forward ventricle should be wider than longer. A narrow and longer forward ventricle is a marker for vermian degenesis. Here we could locate this hyperechoic lesion, which is very typical of cerebellar hemorrhage. After a couple of weeks, we will have a subtraction lesion of this side of the cerebellum. We can also lose the normal contour of the posterior aspect of the cerebellum when we have fusion of the cerebellar hemispheres, uh, like in this case of rhomboencephalosynapsis. Sometimes we can have overestimated cisterna magna because of the bone shadowing. We can see here the interruption of the distal bone. With we tilt a little with the probe, we will obtain a clear view of the cisterna magna. If we have an enlarged cisterna magna, like in these situations, that should prompt a complete multiplanar evaluation. This is a well-known sign of the obliterate cisterna magna and the banana shape of the cerebellum that is associated with open spina bifida. In routine screen, we should evaluate the fetal spine, the integrity of the skin, and with slight tilt movements of the probe, we should identify the conus medullaris. Rotating the probe 19 degrees, we will obtain an axial evaluation of the spine with the identification of the ossification centers and with tilt and slide movements we can evaluate all the spine. The first part of these guidelines also give us information about the axial screening plans on first trimester and early second trimester. In this little clip, we can see all of the evaluation and we can have the precession that the plants are millimeters apart. On this tomographic reconstruction of all of the axial plants, we are able to identify the choroid plex, the fox, the aqueduct of Silvius, the thalami, the fourth ventricle and the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. Until recently, we thought that this fluid filled cavity was the third ventricle. But as we can see here in this multiplanar reconstruction, the dot of reference is far too high to be the third ventricle, and it is the caval valley interpositum and that is clearly visible at 17 weeks 
here the carbon valley interpositum and here the corpus callosum. On the screening, we should look for head shape and ossification. Here, a decreased skull ossification, which is typical of osteogenes imperfecta, or the typical lemon shape of the open spina bifida. We should also look for the skull integrity, here a posterior encephalocell or an anencephaly. We also should evaluate the fox, here an example of holoprosing cephaly. We should also look at the obliteration of the fourth ventricle as a marker of open spina bifida as described by Bushakov, which is the axial translation of the sign described by Shawi. We can have asymmetrical choroid plexus, which are normal variant, but we could also have a small choroid plexus. If the choroid plexus occupies less than 50% of lateral ventricle, we should uh, schedule a re-evaluation because it could be a marker for early ventricle megaly. We can also have a choroid plexus that occupy all of the lateral ventricle that is described as dry brain and this is a marker of open spina bifida described by Shawi. For the evaluation of the posterior fossa on the first trimester, we should consider two plans. The first one, where we could identify the cerebellum, and the second one, a little bit more caudal, where we could identify the choroid plexus and the fourth ventricle. An enlarged posterior fossa is an abnormal finding and should deserve our attention. It could be transient, but it's also a marker for posterior fossa pathology like black pouch, dandy walker or other brain pathology. We should consider invasive testing and re-evaluate it 15-17 weeks. We should not close the diagnosis too early. In this situation, we have a thin brain stain and a brain stain to occipital bone superior to 95 percentile, which is strongly associated with aneuploidies and pathology of the posterior fossa. The first half of these guidelines also give us the indication for fetal neurosonography. And I would like to underline the suspicion of CNS both on first or second trimester, family history of inherent role CNS or spinal malformation, previous pregnancy complicated by fetal brain or spinal malformation, or fetus with congenital heart disease. The second half of these guidelines, the second part, cover the targeted neurosonography, which is the multiplanar evaluation of the brain that complements the axial evaluation. In mid-sagittal view, we can identify the carbon cetoposidum, the corpus callosum, the tela choroidea of the third ventricle, the third ventricle, the interthalamic adhesion, the vermis, and the fourth ventricle. Note that we sometimes use pressure when we need to manipulate the fetal head to orientate the probe with the fontanelles. In order to assess the complete corpus callosum, we must assess the rostrum and the splenion. And for that, we should move the probe from the anterior fontanelle to the posterior fontanelle and this little clip shows us the difference of the insonation.
the posture aspect and here clear visible the rostrum. To add a sagittal assessment of the posterior fossa, we must assess via the posterior fontanella, and here we can identify the brainstem, the forward ventricle, the vermis, and the sylvian aqueduct. In order to assess the parasagittal planes, we must tilt a little bit the probe on one side to another, both in trans-abdominal approach or in transvaginal approach. In this parasagittal plane, we should evaluate the integrity of the ventricle wall and also look at the brain adjacent to the ventricle. Here we can see that we have a hyperechoic periventricular area with cystic lesion which are very suggestive of CMV infection. We should also look at the contour of the cortex. Here we have a very abnormal contour that is a sign of malformation of cortical development. We can have a second parasagittal plane through the insula which allows us to evaluate the insula and the convexity of the brain. To obtain the coronal plane from a sagittal one, we should rotate the probe 90 degrees. Doing that, we will obtain the coronal planes and then, with a mix of tilt and slide, we will have all of the coronal planes. We have four typical coronal planes, but the complete coronal evolution is a complete sweep between the four planes. The first one, the transfrontal plane, we could identify the interhemispheric fissure and the sphenoid bone. The second one, the transcaudal plane, we could identify the corpus callosum and the cavum septoplucidum. On the third coronal plane, the transthalamic plane, we could identify the corpus callosum, the cavum septoplucidum, the sylvian fissure, the thalami, and the optic chiasma. This is a plane that we use to study the sylvian fissure operculization. We suspect of abnormal sylvian fissure operculization on axial evaluation, like in this case, and in coronal evaluation we confirm it comparing it to a control. The fourth coronal plane is the transcerebellar one. Here we could identify the occipital horns, the cerebellum and the calcarine sulci. First trimester fetal neurosonography is a new field and I strongly recommend you the reading this paper by Nicola Volpe. In this correlation between a microscopic specimen and the first trimester uh, sagittal evaluation, we could identify the aqueduct of psylliums, the Z-shaped brainstem, the forward ventricle, the choroid plexus, and the vermis. Here we could also identify the aqueduct, the z shape brainstem, the choroid plexus, the fourth ventricle, and the black pouch space. We could identify the same structures at 10 weeks with a little bit less detail, but here we could identify the aqueduct, the z shape brainstem, 
the Vermis, the Ekdut in Axial Evaluation, the Ekdut in Coronal Evaluation, the Choroid Plexus, and the Black Pouch Space. If we have the possibility to have a direct posterior approach of the posterior fossa on the first trimester, we will have a detailed evaluation of it with acudut, the choroid plexus and the fourth ventricle. The choroid plexus is this tiny thing here, the Z-shaped brain stem, the anterior membranose area, the posterior membranose area and the black pouch space. Here in the endovaginal direct approach of the posterior fossa we can see the brain stem with the angle, the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, the aqueduct, the vermis, the anterior membranose area and the posterior membranose area and the medulla oblongata. In conclusion, first trimester fetal neurosonography is a new open field. It depends on multiplanar evaluation with high resolution probes. I think the 3D evolu evaluation is crucial to help to discriminate uh, different anatomic details. But be aware that many of the findings may be transient, so we should not close the di diagnosis at this early gestational age. Any suspicion should be re-evaluated at 15-17 weeks. Fetal neurosonography is a multiplanar evaluation. We should always start with a complete axial evaluation, which is complemented by sagittal and coronal evaluation. We depend on high resolution probes with transvaginal and transabdominal approach. 3D volume acquisition may prove very helpful. Doppler evaluation have a limited value on this field. At the end of our fetal neurosonography, we may need more information. We may have to schedule a re-evaluation. We may have to have a genetic consultation, an invasive testing, or an MRI. Fetal MRI is complementary to neurosonography, not to a screening evaluation of the fetal brain. I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be glad to have any questions or comments on my email. Thank you. Thank you.